So in this whole unit, we've been looking at how DNA affects our genetics. We looked at uh, different alleles on chromosomes, dominant, recessive, and other forms of uh, co-dominance and sex linkage. Uh, we started looking at um, how we can uh, examine the DNA by breaking it apart. We looked at pedigree charts to find out the history of our genetics. Well, what we're going to do now is we're working in an uh, area called biotechnology. And here's where we're going to start playing around with the DNA itself. And part one of biotechnology is going to be genetic engineering. We're going to talk about what, uh, why genetic engineering is done and actually how it's done. So, what is genetic engineering? That's adding or changing the DNA of an existing organism. We can add DNA to an organism, we can change the existing DNA, and this is when it's done by human manipulation. We can talk about some other natural ways in which DNA changes later. That's more evolution and selective breeding. So what we'll do in a lot of cases is we'll take a gene from one organism and we'll put it into another organism. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify the organism genetically. We're making a genetically modified organism. And if you think about the letters, you may have heard this term before, GMO. There's a lot of talk nowadays about are GMOs a good idea, are they a bad idea? They exist. They're genetically modified organisms. They're organisms where people have taken genes from one type of organism and stuck it into another type of organism. And there's a lot of geneti genetically modified organisms out there. A lot of grains, a lot of vegetables, some fruits, um, there's a lot of products that have been made by genetically modifying organisms. So there's a lot of stuff out there. So the next question is, why would you do it? Why would you genetically modify something? Well, there's a lot of important reasons why. One reason why we'd want to take genes that don't belong in an organism and stick in an organism is to improve the qualities of that organism. What are we talking about? Soybeans, for example. Soybeans produce a healthy type of oil. Um, I forget the exact name of it, but it's an oil that uh, that's good for you. And what we can do is we can genetically modify the soybeans, and they produce even more of this oil. Golden rice. Now, I don't know if you've heard of golden rice before, but it's actually rice that contains more vitamins. They put genes into the um, the rice plants that produces rice that has more vitamins than white rice, especially uh, vitamin A, I believe. So there's your regular rice, there's your golden rice, and that has more vitamins than that because it's been genetically modified. Other reasons why we want to genetically modify something is to avoid problems in creating the organism, growing the product, for example. Corn. This is interesting. Corn's been modified so it contains a chemical that resists insects. What they did was they took corn and they inserted a gene for like a pesticide. So the plant, the corn, would actually naturally produce <coughs> low levels of this pesticide. And then when insects try to come in and eat the corn, like they did to these guys over here, insects die off because these guys are insect resistant now. And now we've got more corn strawberries. Strawberries have been modified so they can resist very cold temperatures so that when the, the temperature drops like a crazy weather day, it doesn't actually ruin the crops. Some strawberries are genetically modified and look, it actually increases the size of the strawberry itself. There's also creating drought resistant wheat. Wheat that can grow with less water. Water is kind of a big topic these days. Everybody wants to make sure we're not using too much water because there's more people who want to use more water. So if we can have plants that can grow just as well with less water, that's a good thing. The third reason is one that we're going to sort of focus on a little bit today, and that is creating chemicals. Why would you want to create chemicals? Well, we would want to create certain chemicals that human beings need. And there's a couple of really important ones. Insulin's a big one. It's one of the first ones that, um, that we worked on. Uh, we know what insulin is. Interferon. This is actually a chemical 
that works for autoimmune diseases. If you listen to someone who has autoimmune diseases, it helps out. And HGH is actually human growth hormone, which is used for all sorts of reasons to make our lives better. So that's why we want to do it. And we're going to focus kind of on this one today when I show you how we do it. So now let's talk about how it's going to be done. Before we get to the actual steps and how it's going to be done, let's talk about some of the important parts that we're going to be using. One of the first parts, the big part, is a thing called plasmids. Most likely you haven't heard this term before, but it's a pretty simple concept. Now bacteria, they contain not a nucleus because they're prokaryotic, but they do contain a main ring of DNA. And that contains all the genes for the, for the bacteria, for all the stuff it needs to make. But what else is floating around in bacteria are smaller rings of DNA called plasmids. Now, these smaller rings, these plasmids, they act just like DNA. They can undergo DNA replication. They can be read in protein synthesis to create proteins. So they're, they're DNA in every sense of the word, except they're not part of the main ring, they're these smaller rings of DNA. And when the bacteria replicates, it doesn't just replicate this main ring, but it also replicates the plasmids. And you're going to see why that's important in a little while. So, here's the case. Here's like our bacteria. There's our big ring of DNA. This is like the main part of the DNA. There's also these smaller rings floating around. And when it replicates, look. It doesn't only just replicate the bacterial DNA, it also replicates the plasmids. So that's going to be kind of important. Because it's the plasmids that are going to be used to take other genes and put them into different cells. So it's called a vector. It's a way of getting something somewhere else. And the plasmids are going to be our vector for putting new genes into other organisms. Now, another big part of this are restriction enzymes. But we've already talked about restriction enzymes when we did gel electrophoresis. Remember how we use these chemicals to chop up the DNA into different pieces? Well, these are the same types of chemicals. These are enzymes that cut DNA in specific places. And those specific places are between certain base pairs. So you have a base pair sequence in your DNA, and the restriction enzyme latches onto that and breaks the chain of DNA. And here's what I didn't tell you about before. The way it breaks it, it breaks it kind of at, a, at an angle, sort of, so that one part, one strand of the DNA is slightly longer than the other strand. And this is what's referred to as a sticky end. See, for example, here we've got our DNA here, and our restriction enzyme doesn't just chop it straight across. It chops it kind of like at an angle here, so it leaves a little bit here that's only one set of bases, and a little bit here that are one set of bases. And they're referred to as sticky ends, because remember, these nitrogen bases want to bond to something else. So if you get another T near this guy, it'll latch right on. Another T, another A, another A will latch right on. So the restriction enzyme cuts it and leaves these ends here, which are ready to attach to some other DNA. What do we use restriction enzymes for? There's two things we want to do with restriction enzymes. Number one, when we find the gene that we want to insert into a different organism, we've got to chop that gene out of the existing chromosome. So we're going to use restriction enzymes. And we're going to also use it to cut open that circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. So we're going to use the um, restriction enzyme to actually break open the ring. That's where we're going to insert the gene. So, let's take a look now at the steps as to how we do recombinant DNA. It's called recombinant DNA because we are recombining DNA from different organisms. So, what we end up with is recombinant DNA. So, here's the steps. And it seems like it's a pretty simple process, but it actually took a lot of work to figure out how to do this. Our first step, let's go find a gene. What gene do we want to insert into another organism? Is it the one that makes it drought resistant? Is it the one that produces that uh, 
that um, pesticide, that natural pesticide that keeps insects away. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a chromosome and we're going to look for the insulin gene. That's going to be the insulin gene right there. So, if we want this gene, the one that creates insulin, we want to take this one out of here, what we got to do is we got to use restriction enzymes. Now, restriction enzymes have to cut this in two places, cut it this part off and cut that part off. So, we actually have two restriction enzymes, one that's going to chop it above the gene, one that's going to chop it below the gene. And there it is. The restriction enzymes chopped up the DNA into three parts, and we've got this little gene right here, that's the gene that's coping for insulin. Step number two, so we put that aside for a little while, now we go find a bacteria. And there's ways of getting the little circular rings of DNA out of bacteria. These plasmids right here. So we're going to use a procedure that's going to pull a plasmid or two out of the bacterial DNA. There it is, that step's done. Didn't that look easy? And what we're going to do with this plasmid is we're going to hit this guy with more restriction enzymes. So we're going to take this ring and we're going to chop it open. So we're going to add a restriction enzyme, which causes it to break open like this. And now it's got two sticky ends here and here. But if we go back and remember our gene, our gene was chopped up DNA, so that also had sticky ends. And since we cut both the gene and the plasmid with the same restriction enzyme, we're going to have the same sticky ends. So if you flip back a couple of slides or rewind this a little bit, you'll see that the ends were A-A-T-T. -T. So this has A-A-T-T, -T, and so does the gene that we chopped off. So now all we have to do is take the gene, put it in contact with the plasmid, and those A's and those T's will naturally attract, attach to each other. They'll lock in place. Now, in order to get the DNA backbones, remember the phosphates and sugars, in order to get them to connect with each other, we're going to use DNA ligase, which if you remember when we talked about DNA replication, that was the stuff that came along and finished attaching the nucleotides together when we were making your DNA. So we're using a lot of the same stuff that we've already used before. But now what we've got here is recombinant DNA. There's the plasmid that's from the bacteria, and there's the gene that we got for making human insulin. So, now all we have to do is take this plasmid with the new DNA in it and put it back. In this case, we're going to put it into the bacteria. Now, with the strawberries, we took a gene and stuck in the strawberries. With the corn, we found a gene and we stuck it in the corn DNA. But in this case, we're going to take the plasmid and just stick it back into bacteria. So, there's our regular bacterial DNA in our plasmids. There's our recombinant DNA with that new insulin gene on there. And we're going to stick that back here. So now, when this bacteria replicates, it's going to start making more copies of the gene. And as it makes more copies of that new gene, that little red piece that we saw, Whenever that little red piece gets red during protein synthesis, it's going to produce human insulin. So our new gene, are we going to have bacteria that are going to be creating insulin for human beings? So we take that one bacteria, and there's that special DNA right there. That little special DNA is going to create some insulin. But then when this guy grows, and now there's more bacteria, we're going to have more insulin, and then these guys are going to replicate, we're going to have even more insulin. So just by letting the bacteria naturally reproduce, because we've stuck this little gene in there, we're getting these bacteria as our little insulin factories. And that's it. That's the whole procedure. We use these little plasmid things, cut them open, stick new genes in, put them into another organism, whether it's a bacteria or like the corn plants, and then we just let those genes be expressed. So, found a little summary. There's our bacteria, there's our plasmid, there's that vector plasmid. What we're doing is here's the other part, there's the gene that we want to put in something new. We pull the plasmid out, we pull the gene out, 
Here comes our restriction enzymes. They don't actually look like that. But they chop the sequence. You see those sticky ends now? These guys are going to want to attach to something. And what they'll end up attaching to is this, which has the same sticky ends. And then to connect it all together, we use DNA ligase, which actually doesn't have a tube of glue on it, by the way. It's, it's kind of weird to me. And then once we've got this plasmid, we have recombinant DNA. We can stick that into a bacteria. We can stick that into another organism. And we're all set. So that's it. That's how we can genetically modify organisms. Now what I want you to do is you have an article to read on News ELA about genetically modified organisms and what you think about them.